So I must warn you then that I don't think I'm going to be able to discuss uh, what um, Ned was alluding to, which is how do we go for, from uh, an actual measurement to apply the model that he, um, he described. However, WBase automatically gives you the uh, ability to do that. It basically provides the models. So all you need to do is put them into your optical, uh, uh, the, the description of your stack, and then you're set to go. But before we go into that, um, I wanted to introduce then ellipsometry, which is a method for us to characterize films, which is actually more reliable than RNT because it's not a, um, uh, a it's not a, a, a relative measurement, but rather it is a ratio, and so it sort of uh, not it's all, it, it calibrates itself out whenever you're doing the measurement. Um, so, in order for us to understand how this measurement is done, I have to talk about a little bit of how it's done. So, the importance of polarization of light to understand uh, ellipsometry, what goes on inside an ellipsometry, uh, ellipsometer, so we can do the measurement. Um, the parameters that you uh, extract, which are actually um, completely different from what we've discussed so far, it, they, they're known as psi and del. And so how is it that we work from there back to N and K? And so I don't think I'll have much time for examples, but um, we'll go over it as good as we can. So the thing about polarization is you can think of a uh, an electromagnetic wave as having a vector that is along the electromagnetic field. And um, if you uh, think of unpolarized light, that electromagnetic wave is basically uh, pointing in every direction, right? So if the light is coming towards you and the electric field is vibrating in every possible direction with no, uh, um, or, uh, at a completely random rate, that's what we call unpolarized light. However, if we manage to somehow force this electric field to oscillate always in a particular direction, if we manage to make it uh, uh, just oscillate in one direction, we call, we call it linearly polarized. Now, whatever vector it is that we're using to define the electric field, so maybe the electric field is going this way, or maybe the electric field is going this way, or 45 degrees, whatever it is, just like a vector, we can then define it in terms of two uh, components. And so, um, if we know the amplitude of each component and the phase between uh, those two components, then we should be able to describe what this uh, polarization is. So you could think of, if I have an electric field going like this, and an electric field going like this, and they are going at the same rate, you could see how these vectors are adding up to each other, and all you get is just a nice line in the middle that goes back and forth, right? But what would happen if these vectors are out of phase? So if this vector is growing and maybe this one is contracting and going something like this, think about what is the, uh, the amplitude of that vector that ends up happening, right? So imagine that the vector is going that way. Well, now the vector is point, the, uh, the, the electric field is pointed in this direction. Now as this one comes back and this one grows, now it's pointing sort of in this direction. So what you end up in general terms is a vector that moves around as it progresses, as the electromagnetic wave uh, moves. So in general, we call this uh, uh, elliptically polarized light. In one particular case, where the vectors are exactly 90 degrees off from each other, then you get circularly polarized light. So now that we understand how is it that this can come about, I'll skip this here uh, and go straight to this. So we can then define the polarization light in terms of two vectors. And just for um, using a frame of reference, we can start with a plane of incidence. The plane of incidence is defined as the plane that contains the ray that you're using and uh, is perpendicular to the sample that you're going to be uh, measuring. So the vector of the electromagnetic field within that plane is the uh, S vector. Is that right? S, P? I, I got confused now. Uh, uh, no, the S vector is 
um, perpendicular, and that comes from, um, that's, that's why I, I get confused, because P is not for perpendicular, but S is for perpendicular from the, fr from the German word for perpendicular, whereas P is on the plane. Okay, so if we can think of it that way, now we can just accept that if we have um, polarized light, and we can distinguish between this S and P polarization, we can extract quite a bit of information. And this is with the where the ellipsometry comes, uh, ellipsometer comes into place. Um, just like R and T, it's a contactless uh, setup or a contactless measurement, so you use light. Um, the light is reflected usually, not necessarily, but that's the most common way of doing uh, ellipsometry. You reflect from a uh, sample and uh, and you basically determine the polarization of the light reflected from the sample. And you start with whatever polarization you may want, from circular to linear to whatever it is, but it depends on what uh, uh, ellipsometer you're using, the setup that, it's, uh, that you end up with. Okay, so most straightforward thing uh, to do with ellipsometry is calculate the thickness of a film, but um, you can also extract the uh, optical constants that we've been looking for because ellipsometry is non, uh, well you don't, you don't need a reference and therefore the sensitivity of, or yeah, the sensitivity of ellipsometry is actually significantly better than R and T. Um, so let's see how that works. Um, so the one problem with ellipsometry is that we're not really exposed to the physics that happens what you, when you're measuring with the ellipsometer, right? R and T, we understand it. We can see T means how much light goes through here, and R is how well of a, how good of a mirror this is. But when you're thinking about S and P polarization, it really doesn't mean much to you. The only thing maybe you've used polarized lens, uh, uh, len yeah, glasses, and you know that they do something with the polarization. Yeah, and it turns out that it cancels out one of the polarizations, which are, I think, uh, so as light comes into uh, a, a surface and hits it at a fairly oblique angle, it gets polarized. And so the reason we cannot see very well, for example, when we look into water is because the amount of light that is being reflected at us is bright enough that it overwhelms what we see, right? But the interesting thing is that most of that light is polarized. So if we manage to get rid of that polarized light, then whatever is left there allows us to see the, uh, much clearer what's happening in the water. But that's probably the only thing that we are familiar with when it comes to, to polarization. And so the way I think about ellipsometry is, well, yeah, I don't have to understand, I don't have to get as familiar with the physical part of it. I'll f rely on the maths that make it work and then accept the fact that I will have some information there that then I can deconvolute so that I can get the information that I want, which is n, k, and eventually then you can simulate whatever you want from it. Very specifically, the ellipsometer that we have is an M2000. It's a very old version, so if you look it up now, the same model actually changes the angle uh, automatically. So that's the one thing that we cannot do, but it's actually a really good instrument. Um, so what you see here is the ellipsometer itself, and then we have, well, I'll go into the details of what an ellipsometer schematic looks like. So on one side of the ellipsometer, you have what is called the polarizer. For this particular instrument that we have in the lab, it uses a linearly polarized light for the input. So it ensures then that you always have light coming at a particular angle and it's 45 degrees, so you get exactly the same amount of S and P coming in. And then you have this analyzer on the other side. The analyzer, all that it is, it's a polarizer that you are allowed, that, that is rotating. And as the polarizer rotates, then, yeah. So as the polarizer rotates, you basically are looking at the amplitude of this, uh, uh, polarization vector, and it then forms a sinusoidal wave that you fit with a Fourier uh, uh, transform, 
and from there you get the offset peak and uh, valleys and from there you can actually extract the information now how do we get to there uh, it's a bit complicated to, to, to talk about but as I said just take it as um, this is what I was told and it works and then we'll see how we can extract information out of that so basically the equations for ellipsometry are defined as the ratio of RP to RS so the people uh, the, the reflection coefficient uh, for P polarized light divided by the reflection coefficient of the S polarized light now that has an expression that comes out to be tangent of psi times e to the i alpha so what does it mean well the tangent of psi is effectively the amplitude ratio of there and gamma uh, and delta sorry is the phase difference between rp and uh, and, and rs so independently of what they are the interesting thing of it is that they carry information with them and so if we can determine psi and del then we could work our way back to extract n and k and then eventually do whatever we want with that and so you may be thinking well this is not quite right because we're measuring something completely strange and then we extract n and k and then we use that for our benefit so that's not the case for R and T of course because we measure R we measure T but it's the same thing it's just we're more familiar with R and T but still to try and model that we still need a model that proposes N and K so as far as I know there is no technique that measures no optical technique that measures N and K directly you always infer it from a different sort of measurement so this is when you look at the uh, the way uh, the equation for ellipsometry comes about this is where you realize the power of it in terms of its stability and reliability you see it's a ratio and so if you have noise the noise sort of cancels out if the intensity of the light goes up and down unless the the s polarization intensity is going uh, uh, it's changing at a different rate compared to the p polarization but that's not the case because you have a lamp that is just uh, an incandescent lamp as the source then everything cancels out so you don't need the double beam you don't need to calibrate anything because we're not measuring reflection all we're doing is measuring what is that ratio and then we interpret it from there this was just a reminder that one represents the difference in phase angle and the other one is effectively the amplitude just remembering that rs and rp are complex numbers and so if you take a, a ratio of a complex number the only way to represent this ratio fully is if you have at least two sets of information it could be the imaginary part and the real part or the amplitude and the phase and so if we accepted that yeah that's what it is I use this instrument that somehow manages to give me psi and del then what do I do with it and so this is actually extracted from the uh, the, the, the user manual from the ellipsometer and so this is the procedure you measure from there you extract psi and del but psi and del are a ratio of r s and rp and we know that r s and rp are a function of n and k therefore if i can change n and k until i fit psi then i can recreate my measurement and so i need to propose then a way to have n and k one of the uh, of the of the ways to do it is with a model like the lorentz oscillator um, that then you put within your optical system you change the parameters in that model and once again it's even it's, it's twice removed right you have psi and del for one side then you have the broadening parameters and the energy you're changing those to come 
fit together so that you can extract n and k. The amazing thing is that if you have a good model, you actually get such a good fit, and if you can prove that it's unique, then you're pretty sure that your results are going to be reliable. Um, so thickness is usually the easiest thing to extract, particularly because you usually do it for uh, dielectric layers. However, n and k can be extracted fairly accurately if uh, you have a good enough sample. So this brings me back to what I had done before, where I showed you that if you're going to do something of your, uh, with your measurement, you need to think about really how are you going to do it so that it gives you uh, good information. So one thing that is easy to demonstrate here compared to the RNT is how much better measurements get as you average more. So I told you that that was a key issue, right? On RNT, you spend more time. On the ellipsometer, it takes about a fraction of a second to do one measurement. So notice very quickly how clean your measurements go if you take from 1 to 64 measurements. Now, because we're not going to have time, um, I'm not going to show you uh, what you could do with W basin ellipsometry, except to show you that the models that um, Ned have talked about are naturally available there. I don't think I'm going to have time anyway, but I'll, I'll just show you then, because now you probably want to see, say, okay, how can I apply what Ned talked about onto my ellipsometry measurement, and hopefully can I use it with W base? So I just wanted to show you that it's a relatively straightforward thing to do, because all those oscillators are already um, within the uh, uh, within W base. So for example, imagine that I do have a gallium arsenide layer, and um, I don't know, we'll do a 300 micron. So this is tabulated data that is like well accepted to be N and K for gallium arsenide, and so we're going to use that to generate some data for the ellipsometry measurement of, I'm just, to make it easier, I'm going to do one single angle of incidence, and that should be enough. Okay, so if you were to do a measurement with the ellipsometer on a gallium arsenide sample, this is what you, observe, yeah, what you would observe. But let's imagine that you had no idea what this was, right? You just thought, okay, I know, not that you don't have any idea, because you have to have some idea to start from somewhere. Uh, but what you would say is, okay, I know that it is some sort of direct band gap, it's in the three fives, and so can I propose a model for it that would fit it? So I'm just going to copy the data and assume that this is measured data. Right? But then I didn't know that it was gallium arsenide, but rather I knew that it was some sort of material that, and I'm going to save a lot of time for us, so that I'm going to show you already one definition for gallium arsenide that is already parametrized. So you can see here gallium arsenide has been parametrized with six oscillators. Those oscillators are basically the oscillators that Ned talked about. Now if you didn't know what the amplitudes and, and, and uh, broadening and every term of that uh, oscillator was, then you would have to go here and say, yep, I'll fit that one and fit that one, and so on, oops, yep. And so what you see is that you have a significant number of parameters that you need to fit. And so usually what you do is you start from a point where you more or less know, okay, well, in this range, the direct bang up is going to be more important, so then I would focus on the first oscillator, the oscillator at uh, number zero there. And the other ones I don't need to fit. So you fit that one, and then you fit the other one, and so on and so forth. Now, it has already been done for us. So um, this is the data that we generated that was based on N and K that were measured. And everybody agrees that that's 
acceptable N and K for gallium arsenide. Now I'm going to generate data using the model that is based on those oscillators. And so as you do that, you see that there is no difference. So that parametrization that has been already done for us has been so perfect that now it generates N and K perfectly for gallium arsenide. So you would then need to be do the same thing. And I don't, as I said, I don't have enough time to show you. So if you were to use a little bit of bismuth into gallium arsenide, and then that first oscillator would be moving significantly away from 1.414 in this case to a lower band gap, so uh, lower energy, and the broadening would be changed, then that's basically what you would do. You would start from gallium arsenide and say, OK, vary that one and see how well it forms. So the advantage of uh, going this way when you're doing a, 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 a pyramid, well, when you're trying to fit data, is that for one, it's going to be physical because these models have been uh, ensured, or as uh, Ned talked about, it's a Lorentz oscillator, but then through the Kramers chronic relationship, then the real part of the index of refraction has been ensured that it's physically. Um, sound. So for one it's that, it's going to be physically sound, and then there's going to be some significance to it. So n and k is not just going to be a number, but it's going to come from a transition, right, uh, within the band gap and things like that. So this is the advantage of this. It does take time to fit, but it is the most reliable way for you to build some physical model that you can then rely on. You could always go and do something, and no, I don't have time, but you could always go and say, fit N and K, and W base does it for you. It changes N and K at each point until everything fits right, but for the most part, it means absolutely nothing, right? Uh, and in some cases, and I was going to show you that, but it's, uh, it's, we don't have time. You can actually get there with N and K if you have a good starting point, for example, for silicon. But I'll leave it here so that Ned can actually finish off with an interesting way of measuring things more directly. So I'll leave you to it, Ned.